Hello, this is Eric. Today is February the 4th, 2023. And in this video, we will be addressing in detail the second reign in Brazil. Oh yeah, that was a very important phase of the history of Brazil. And this guy you're seeing here on your screen is Dom Pedro II. Yes, he was the son of Dom Pedro I, who abdicated, as you could learn in one of our previous classes, right? And, uh, you know, he happened to be the man in power uh, in Brazil that stayed in power for the longest time in history, right? So this was certainly a very important time of the history of Brazil, and we are going to try to address it in detail, okay? Well, if you remember the last class, uh, we were talking about the Regency period, right? Uh, so as I had said, Dom Pedro I abdicated, Right, and then uh, you know his son Dom Pedro II or Pedro II, Pedro de Alcântara, was really young at the time. So uh, according to the Constitution of 1824, he would only be allowed to become emperor at the age of 18. So because of that, we had uh, you know the Regency period, uh, which would remain until Pedro II or Pedro de Alcântara could become emperor. However, there were many and many uprisings in Brazil, and really the country was uh, at risk of being divided. You know, there, there was this uh, really uh, this feeling of federalism that was going on in the country. You know, many provinces wanting to become independent, and then uh, in view of all of that, all of those uprisings, uh, many politicians saw the coronation of Dom Pedro II as a solution, right? Um, and there was the problem of the age. So what they did, basically, was they came up with the coming of the age coup, applied in 1840, and because of this coup, Pedro de Alcantara became emperor Dom Pedro II at the age of 14. What would you think if someone told you that at the age of 14 you had to become the emperor of such a big country like Brazil? I don't think I would like that. But Dom Pedro II didn't really have a choice. So, uh, you know, his reign lasted until 1889, right? And as I said, you know, he was the man who remained in power for the longest time in the history of the nation. Well... Uh, so let's start talking about this reign. Um, you know, the politics of the second reign are marked by the presence of two political parties. This is very important. We had the Liberal Party, the members known as Luzia, and the Conservative Party, the members known as Saquarema. Basically, there was not really a difference here because both parties were composed of politicians that were part of the elite. That means that they were only interested in their, in their own interests. <laughs> but the difference is that the liberal really saw the country as, uh, you know, uh, basically, uh, you know, they, they wanted, not that, that they saw the country like that, but they wanted each province to have more autonomy. And the conservative party, they really wanted, you know, the power to be, uh, you know, more in the hands of Dom Pedro II. That was the difference here. So, Dom Pedro II, in 1847, um, you know, he decided to implement the parliamentarism in Brazil, right? He understood that his father, you know, had not been happy with the way he tried to uh, to preside the nation. So he came up with this topsy-turvy parliamentarism. Why? Because uh, basically Dom Pedro II uh, used the moderating power to choose what would be called, you know, the president of the council here in Brazil, which is equivalent to the office of prime minister, okay? So, yeah, <laughs> it was kind of funny, 
but basically he used his power to choose the prime minister or, as I said, the president of the council, right? So here you have a illustration of the time, you know, Don Pedro II choosing, you know, the president of the country uh, of the council, uh, you know, from the liberal or for the conservative parties, you know, one at a time. So he was kind of like, uh, you know, handling these two parties in a very clever manner uh, along these years. Well, um, you know, the second reign was also a period of not many internal conflicts, right, uh, as had happened during the Regency period. But even so, we had, uh, for example, uh, that was not, not, not the only riot, right, but this was the most... Uh, you know, uh, famous, let's say, riot that took place here in Brazil, and that was the Praieta Revolution, right? The Praieta Revolution. So, uh, you know, this name was basically associated uh, with the name of the street that in Portuguese is uh, Beach Street, right? And that was a place where, uh, you know, a, a vehicle called Diário Novo, of the liberal group, remember the liberal party, you know, that was the place where this Diário uh, do Novo was located, Diário Novo, sorry. And because of that, they were known as the Praieros, like, you know, the guys, the folks from the beach street, right? And, you know, these guys were really liberals. And by this time, uh, basically, we also had in Europe, uh, something that was uh, happening, you know, almost at the same time, and that was, uh, you know, the, uh, the the socialist revolution in Europe. So these guys were really influenced, you know, by uh, by this all this movement that was going on in Europe at the time around 1848, right? And what they basically uh, wanted, you know, actually. These guys were in Recife, and Recife is in the northeastern area of Brazil. And since uh, the sugar cane market began to fall, you know, the northeastern area of Brazil fell with it, right? So uh, this, was a, uh, this was an area with too much poverty, you know, uh, too, ve very few opportunities and you know, people in this in this region of the country had a really tough life, so they were basically complaining about that. And you know, uh, basically, with the support of the Federalists, the Socialists, the Republicans, and the popular sectors, the Liberals first saw to try to take uh, you know the, the 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 governor of the province, Antonio Chinchorro da Gama, out of the office. Right, so they try to do that, and you know they basically uh, released the manifest or the manifesto to the world, published in 1849, and basically they brought the demands of this liberal group that, uh, and the demands were free and universal vote, freedom of the press, work as a guarantee of life for citizens, retail trade only for Brazilian citizens harmony and effective independence of political powers, the extinction of the moderating power for Dom Pedro II, new federalist organization, reform of the judiciary, extinction of interest collection, extinction of the current military recruit recruitment system, and they wanted the Portuguese to be banished from the country. Right, so as you can see, you know, among these demands, we can see a clear feeling, a clear sense of, uh, uh, you know, uh, of federalism, of republicanism, of, uh, you know, they were against the Portuguese that still were here, you know, ruling the roost here in Brazil. Uh, they were really uh, influenced by the socialist ideals and especially by the republic ideals. So basically, this is what happened, okay? And, well, it, it really spread throughout the state of Pernambuco, right? And there were confrontation, confrontations in the cities of Olinda and Recife, 
right? However, you know, these liberals were repressed by the government in 1850, more precisely by Captain Antonio de Sampaio, right? And, you know, they were overcome. So, um, well, we can also talk about uh, the fact that the internal peace, because they, there, there were not too many riots, you know, this peace that came with the government of Dom Pedro II favored the consolidation of the interests of the ruling class represented by the large rural landowners, okay? Economy in the Second Reign. So here, right in the beginning of the Second Reign, we have the, you know, the rise of the black gold, right? Coffee. Oh yeah, that was the, the, the word of the, of the order, right? And why is that? Well, we have to understand that the Industrial Revolution was in full swing, and basically, you know, people worked, uh, you know, in, in the factories, in the plants for the companies, and uh, they work it a lot. You know, they work it for many hours. And coffee basically helped the employers to stay uh, awake, you know, during the time they were working. Thus, you know, the, the value, uh, you know, the appreciation given to coffee, right? And we found uh, the, the, the Brazilians, uh, the Brazilian authorities at the time, uh, sorry, not the Brazilian authorities, yeah, we, we could say that they also noticed that. But, you know, the, the landowners realized that in the region of Paraíba Valley and São Paulo, the soil was really, really appropriate, you know, for coffee. So, uh, you know, if we add up, you know, the international demand and the fact that we had a good soil, especially in São Paulo, that's why we are going, that, that's how we understand how, uh, why coffee became so important in the country, right? And because of coffee, we had a, let's say, uh, the beginning of a industrial revolution in Brazil. It was not really uh, an industrial revolution, right? But we had some factories here and there, right? And we had people like Baron of Mauá, you know, he was a very preeminent uh, businessman at the time. So, yeah, let's say that we had the seeds of uh, industrialism being sowed here. And then only in the, in the next century with President Getulio Vargas, we would really, really have, you know, the, the industrial revolution uh, happening in Brazil. Okay, and you know because of uh, you know considering the high costs involved in acquiring slaves, landowners supported the arrival of immigrants, especially Italians, to work in the coffee plantations. So that was a time, and we are also going to see that the abolishment of slavery was becoming more and more an important topic at the at the Brazilian agenda. Right, there was way too much pressure from England, and you know, even from the very uh, former slaves, you know, to to see the, the abolishment of slavery in Brazil, and England was not really interested in the abolishment of slavery because they were good guys. No, they needed people to consume their goods, to consume their manufactured products, and they saw these slaves now. Uh, being employed people as consumers, you know, that would consume their products. That's the reason why they opposed slavery uh, right in the beginning of the um, of the 19th century, right? Actually, even before that. Well, anyway, so uh, we had, uh, you know, the b before the actual abolishment of. Uh, slavery in Brazil with the Aurea law that we are going to see uh, shortly. We had some, uh, let's say, uh, provisional uh, measures that were taken against the slavery in Brazil. So one of them, for example, uh, let me see here. Uh, 
uh, I, I'm trying to find a name here. Oh, yeah. Well, here you have, for example, uh, you know, the, um, the laws that were being enacted here uh, against this, uh, you know, the African slavery. So we had Eusebio de Queiroz law, for example, that uh, basically established the end of slave trade on slave ships. You know, so going back now to that other, uh, oh yeah, to this slide here, we're going to understand why it became so expensive for the landowners, you know, to, to pay for the slaves because they could not be brought in slave ships anymore. And basically they had to be purchased from the northeastern area in Brazil. And it was really, really expensive to bring them here to Sao Paulo or even to the Paraíba Valley. Right, so it was uh, more profitable for these landowners to bring the immigrants, uh, especially the Italians, who would be indebted here with them. You know, because these uh, landowners, you know, they basically sponsored, you know, the, the 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 immigrants coming to Brazil, and along the time, these immigrants, you know, they uh, became indebted here and yeah that was a big problem but anyway uh so we had here uh you know that was happening in the in the economy in the economy aspect and we had something that was very important the paraguayan war after the paraguayan war we're going to get we're going to go back to the slavery issue okay but let's understand the paraguayan war that was a very very important event right, in the history of Brazil. It was a catastrophic uh, conflict, right? It all started because Uruguay, uh, that had uh, recently become uh, independent, you know, Uruguay was located in a strategic point on the edge of the Etato River, right? And Brazil and Argentina supported the Colorados. And this, just one more thing here. This strategic point was strategic for Brazil, for Argentina, and for Paraguay also, right? And Brazil and Argentina supported, uh, during the civil war in Uruguay, the Colorados party. While Sol Solano Lopez, you know, the Paraguayan dictator, was a supporter of the Blancos party. So you see conflict going on here, right? Because these Blancos could allow the Paraguayans to use the port of Montevideo. However, the Colorados won the war, right? And, you know, because of that, we had little by little Solano Lopez, uh, you know, really showing who he was. And he started attacking, uh, you know, Brazil. So he attacked, and I'm not being here, um, I'm not saying that because I'm Brazilian and because I, I am against Solano Lopez, okay? I'm trying to be, uh, you know, the more uh, impartial I can, okay? So Solano Lopez, you know, he attacked the Brazilian ship Marques, Marques de Olinda, and he imprisoned, you know, this Brazilian ship on the Paraguay River. Soon after that, he attacked the city of Dourados, in Mato Grosso do Sul, apparently because he sent, uh, uh, you know, a letter to to Dom Pedro II, uh, but Dom Pedro II was not really interested in negotiating. So he attacked the city of Dorados. You know, that was a really, really uh, cruel attack. Many people died. And Solano Lopez not only did that, but he crossed it the Argentine territory without the authorization from President Mitre in Argentina. And he conquered Rio Grande do Sul because of that. So, uh, you know, the territory would be retaken at the Battle of Riachuelo, but it took a while for Brazil to recover this territory, as you are going to see. Right, so Solano Lopes, you know, uh, not only for that, but he had been uh, using all his possibilities, you know, to form a strong army. You know, he was building a, a lot of weapons. So he really, really wanted to make Paraguay become a superpower. That was something that was clear. And he was really, you know, he had all the characteristics, the features of a dictator, 
right? So here we have a painting of the first uh, war, the first conflict of this war, right? As you can see, it was really bad, you know? So uh, after this first attack uh, that I mentioned here, you know, uh, when Solano Lopez uh, attacked the city of Dorados, right? We had then the Battle of Riachuelo, right? And then Brazil uh, suggested that Uruguay, Argentina, and Brazil join forces against Solano Lopez and, you know, Paraguay. So then, you know, that happened in May for, on May 1st, 1865. Then we had the Battle of Tuyuti in 1866. 13 people died. We have to understand, people, that Brazil did not have an army at the time. So what they did, basically, was, you know, they recruited everyone. And in many cases, you know, the elite members of society were not interested in, you know, in going to war. So they would send the slaves, the slaves that were treated as garbage here in Brazil. They had to go to war to fight a, a, a war that they did not understand and to defend a country that punished them day by day through slavery. So could you see the slaves fighting in a decent way, in a justifiable way? No, impossible. But even so, they went there, and out of these 13,000 13, people who died, many of them were slaves, right? But anyway, during this battle of the Tuyuti, since, you know, the Triple Alliance was fighting here, we had a Triple Alliance victory. So General Osorio, or General Osorio as you prefer, you know, he left command because he realized that, you know, the, the, the army was not prepared to face a war. And he was replaced by Marquis of Caxias. Do you remember him? Yes. This is the guy that fought uh, some of the conflicts uh, you know, that defended the, the empire in some of the conflicts during the Regency period. He was very experienced and he would become Duke of Caxias, right? So he, this guy trained the army, right? And then we had the Laguna Retreat, Brazilian troops defeated by Solano Lopez troops here. Yeah, because basically when you go to a war, you should at least know the territory. But the Brazilian troops, although they had been trained by Duke of Caxias, they had no idea of what the terrain in, in, in Paraguay looked like. So they basically, as they were going inland inside Paraguay, they lost, you know, this first conflict here. Uh, we have in this white, on this white horse here, Duke of Caxias, right? And under Caxias' command, Brazil immediately achieved several victories. And, uh, he, uh, and Brazil conquered uh, the fort of Umaita, right? That was a fort that had been originally built by Brazil. And so this fort was captured on February 19th, 1868. That was quite an achievement, right? And then we have Desembrada, right? This is an event uh, that consists of three battles fought in Itororó, in Havaí. Uh, this is where you, you see this picture here. Angostura and Lomas Valentinas, right? These uh, battles were fought in December 1868, right? So we had here, you know, this, uh, let's say, this phase of the war going from 1866 to 1868. By this time, guys, you know, basically it was Brazil versus Paraguay because Argentina and Uruguay were, uh, in practical terms, out of the war, right? So it became a matter of honor for Dom Pedro II. And after conquering Asuncion in January 1869, Caxias left the command of the war. Do you know why? because he was 
uh, you know, he saw no reason uh, for Brazil to continue with this war. Basically, uh, uh, by this time, uh, Solano Lopez, you know, m was recruiting even the children to fight. So he was like fleeing across the territory and many of the men, uh, the Paraguayan men, had died, so he was recruiting the children, and and these children, they would uh, they would put on um, oh my God, what is the name? They would disguise, and so that they could be uh, not identified as children, but so that they could be seen as adults, but they were children, and. Can you can you imagine the carnificent the, the 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 situation of this war? So as the Brazilian troops uh, started fighting against the Paraguayan quote unquote troops because they were children, and as they realized that those were kids, instead of stopping that, they shot against those kids and they killed many and many kids. So the level of cruelty, that's why this war is still recalled nowadays, because the level of cruelty from both sides uh, reached a, you know, a, a it's kind of difficult to say that, you know. I, I cannot imagine, you know, kids using their guns and being shot. It, it is something that really... Uh, I cannot even imagine, you know, how that happened. And the thing is that at the end of the war, you know, uh, we basically had Paraguayan dictator in Cerro Cota on March 1st, and he refused to surrender. So the Brazilian troops shot against him and killed him. That was the end of the Paraguayan war. That was the end of a really bloody war, a war that we hope that never takes place again in this continent. So, as a con as the consequences of the Paraguayan war, we can mention the fact that Paraguay was devastated, right? We had approximately 80% um, of the population killed in, in Paraguay, right? I mean, 80%, around 80% of the population of Paraguay was killed. So basically, you would only find, find some kids, some women, and very, very few men, aside from the, uh, from the elderly there. So yeah, Paraguay was devastated. And it lost part of the territory to Argentina and Brazil. It had to contract a debt of war with the countries of the Triple Alliance. What an absurd. Despite doing what they did, okay, yes, that was a, that was a, a war. Uh, yes, the, let's say the population, the Paraguayan population fought the war, but they had no choice. And even so, uh, you know, faced with all the cruelty that they practiced against the children of Paraguay, they were capable of charging a debt of war. Uruguay forgave the debt in 1885. Now, it took more time for Argentina and Brazil to do that. Yeah, the debt was only forgiven by Argentina in 1942 and, and from Brazil in 1943. Well, Brazil, uh, yeah, <laughs> compared to Brazil, we lost uh, very few lives, right? But even so, around 80,000 people died, right? And uh, no, the war greatly affected the economy, right? Uh, Dom Pedro II... Uh, had to make many loans, uh, you know, using British money, right? Uh, Argentina secured territories that were previously contested by Solano Lopez as the Provincia Corrientes and the Chacon region. England did not participate directly in the conflict, 
but was the only country to profit from it. Oh, what a surprise, huh? The country expanded its market in America, lent money for the reconstruction of Paraguay and to Brazil, which increased its debt. Uh, not bad at all for England. Huh? The military demanded, and that was a problem here, Dom Pedro II had not only the problem of the debt, but now the military returned home stronger than ever and demanding recognition, salary increases and promotions that were not carried out. Because of this, some officials began to adhere to the Republican ideals. Other than that, uh, you know, another, uh, another factor that contributed for the end of monarchy and consequently of the second reign in Brazil was, uh, you know, the, the, Christie, uh, the Christie issue, right? The Christie issue or, or question began with an altercation between British sailors and officials in Rio de Janeiro. Right. And, you know, there was a law saying that, you know, in these cases, uh, you know, the British citizens would not be uh, they would not face the Brazilian courts. However, the Brazilian government in this occasion asked those res those responsible to respond in court in the country and to pay compensation. So there was a really, 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 really an issue here. So in the face of the British refusal, Brazil broke off diplomatic relations with the United Kingdom for two years. So that really, uh, you know, that was really costly for Pedro II in terms of, let's say, uh, diplomacy with England. And to cap it all, we have the issue of the abolishment or the abolitionism in the second reign. So as I had said, we had, uh, you know, the, the fact that the slave regime was in decline in several uh, European countries, right? Be not because they were good, but because they wanted, you know, to grow financially, say, and they wanted, you know, these, uh, these slaves to become consumers, Right, and then uh, little by little, England was pressuring in Brazil, and initially we had the Eusebio de Queiroz law, right, the end of the slave trade on slave ships. Then we have the Free Womb Law in 1871. It granted freedom from that date to all children born of slave wombs. Now it didn't say anything about the you know the slaves that were slaves before the law. So uh, by this, you can notice that, you know, yeah, not few people complain against this law. And we had the absurd sexagenarian law. That was like a joke because it said that slaves over 60 years of age could receive freedom. The problem is that the slaves normally did not live longer than 40 years of age, right? Yeah, so that was really a joke. And, well, at three years after the Sixth Legionarian Law, then we had the Aurea Law. It was signed by Princess Isabel, daughter of Pedro II, right? And it granted total freedom to slaves who still existed in Brazil, a little more than 700,000 abolishing slavery in the country. The problem is that they didn't worry about the slaves. They were still seen with prejudice. They didn't receive any help at all to, you know, to work, to start working. They didn't receive anything. They, ju they were just told, okay, you're free, so manage it. That's what they were told. And, you know, that was basically the beginning of prejudice, of racism uh, in Brazil, even after uh, the abolishment of slavery. And even nowadays, we suffer the consequences of this abolishment that didn't even um, take the issue of slaves seriously. You know, so 
that's how it happened. Here you have a painting of the moment when the when the Aurea Law was signed by Princess Isabel. And as you can imagine, here you have you know the the news on uh, on the paper at the time. And basically, as you can imagine, uh, we also oh yeah we also had some religious some religious issues because Dom Pedro II wanted to manipulate the Catholic Church. You know, some say uh, that he was involved with the masonry, but you know, uh, other documents say that you know he he was not really a member of the masonry. But whatever uh, you know, he had done uh, religiously. Saying the fact is that uh, Pedro II really uh, manipulated. You know who he wanted to be. Uh, you know, uh, in church or who he didn't want, you know, to see in church, leading the church. And that, uh, you know, caused him to have many conflicts with the Pope. And that, you know, that caused him many uh, headaches. And so we had these religious issues. We had, uh, you know, the devaluation of the military, right? The military were not happy with Pedro II that did not provide any salary increases, that did not give, that, sorry, that did not give them enough recognition after, after the Paraguayan uh, war. And also we had the end of slavery that troubled the elites, right? And caused these elites not to support the emperor anymore. And, well, that basically forced the emperor's deposition, right? So, uh, after a while, one year later, one year after the abolishment of slavery, we had the institution of the Republic with no popular participation at all on November 15th, 1889 by Marshal Deodoro da Fonseca, who was the first president of Brazil. And in our next video, we'll be talking about the early days of the Republic in Brazil. Thank you so much for watching this video and see you in our next video.